Hey everyone, and welcome back to today's Saturday live stream. It's great to have you all here today. So we're going to be answering questions today about the medical coding industry. I've got a lot of people that are looking into getting back to school in the fall. They've got a lot of questions about medical coding. We're going to be asking questions about exams. We're going to be talking about certifications, schools, CEUs, studying, and more. So definitely make sure you, you are comfortable. Get yourself commented in the comments. Say, hey, he, he, welcome. Welcome back to the stream, Victoria. Grab yourself a drink. Say hi in the chat. And let's get started. All right. With today's live stream. So, hey, everyone, I've got uh, my crew coming in already. So I hope you guys can hear me okay. My audio usually plays for that video, and it didn't. I don't know where that came through at. My goodness. It is probably, I've been having some tech issues right before the stream. So I'm hoping everything functions okay. But I talked last stream about how I was getting a new PC. I finally caved and allowed my boyfriend to build a basically gaming PC for me. I've been using a gaming laptop, but uh, it's it's not functioning as well as I was hoping as I've grown through my video. So it was taking long to process things. It was just, it was humming really loud. Like the fans were really loud. So you could hear sometimes in the back of my videos, my fans from my PC humming. So I've got my new, my, my, my laptop hummings, but now I've got this new PC and it's got like a million USB ports. And I think I've confused it now because I'm plugging and replugging a million things in with cameras and keyboards and lights and everything. So hopefully everything functions okay today, but yeah, I don't know what the heck now happened to my, I think my, I shut down my um, speakers is what happened probably. So still getting used to some of the new setup, just to kind of give you, I can kind of show you a little bit here probably. So this is, you can see my monitor is mounted now in the back. And then I have a second monitor because uh, I used to use my laptop as my second monitor, but now I've got this huge thing. And then the PCs behind there, it's, it's enormous and had to reorganize my microphone. But the nice thing is my document camera and everything is functioning a lot better now. It's just a lot to, to get the gear set up, get all my buttons queued back up. So if you're new here, hi, I'm Victoria. I'm a medical coder, auditor, educator, and content creator. And on my channel, I provide tips, tricks, and tutorials to help you be successful in a medical coding career. And on Saturdays, I go live to do Q&A. So here we are today for q and I've got a lot of questions that have been hitting me up on Instagram lately. So I have those to go through as well. I actually wanted to start out with one of them because someone did ask a question. They're looking at the CPC preparation on the AAPC website. And depending on the month, they offer all kinds of different deals. So if you haven't been on lately, you know, you don't know what the latest deals are that are that are going on. So let's see. Um, this is the latest deal that we have here is one where they are saying that they are having the code books included. So a question came through from a viewer that said to me, and now I lost my, there it is. That said to me, they're looking to study for the CPC and they've been watching my videos and they mentioned, I mentioned about the AEPC and they want to purchase this bundle. And then when it says free books, does that mean hard copy? So one thing that I've noticed lately is with the courses, they want to do eBooks, but when they're talking about these code books, the code books, my assumption is that the code books are going to be hard copy because they want you to have hard copies for the exam. But it's likely, it is likely that the textbook that they will give you though is the, is the, ebook version. So I have the paper version of the textbook, but I think more so because you they can send these immediately via ebook. I think more so they're sending the textbooks and workbook type materials in ebook format versus just the code books, the code books you're going to need in paper format. So they're more likely to be sending those included in the paper format, but your textbooks and workbooks would likely be ebooks unless you request something else. So that is that first question. 
And I know I saw, who did just say it in here about my, yeah, I just saw the comment come through. I wanted to, I wanted to talk about, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. ah, I lost it. Your boyfriend built you a computer. You probably need to keep that one around. I know we've been, actually my boyfriend and I have been together for seven years, something like that. Um, he's an engineer by trade and he does, you know, gaming and he does a lot of builds. He is like uh, amazing around the house. He, uh, his next, his next thing on my list of honey do's <laughs> is I asked him to replace my outlets in the office. So I have three outlets in here with ones that not only plug in, but also have the USB ports on them. So he does all kinds of amazing stuff for me, like hats off. No, 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 no. So Syed is asking, I studied a lot, but I'm not getting past my first attempt. Can I do Practicode for my exam? I believe you are able to access Practicode before passing your exam. I think most people, though, would prefer not to. If, if you want to, I do believe they give you access to complete Practicode ahead of time. But um, it's usually recommended that you pass the exam first before starting Practicode, kind of just to pace yourself and handle one thing at a time before going from um, you know, trying to trying to toggle both at once because you don't want to focus on Practicode to remove your A when you don't have that CPCA certification just yet. <laughs> Terry Martin is asking, I noticed in the CRC course you give the option of the ebook study guide. My question is, does it allow you to answer and store your answers to back and reference? I don't believe it does that. So the ebook version, I believe is just the, the ebook itself. It does allow you to take flashcards. I can actually show you a little sample here. Let's see if I can get over. Oh, you know what? I don't have Kindle reinstalled in this new PC. I can't bring that up, but I, I don't think it does. I'll have to double check on that one. And you know what? That would be a good uh, question for the FAQs to add to my website, but I don't believe it does allow you to store your answers. You could probably store them in a notebook or something if you wanted to reference back to them. Um, I know it does the flashcards and the highlighting, but I, I, off the top of my head, I don't remind remember about the, the answers. And you can always purchase also the physical version. So if you want a paper version of it, you can go on the AAPC website under their books and software and certification study guides, and you can purchase the paper copy. If anyone prefers a paper copy for either my CRC course or my CPMA course, you can buy them directly from the AAPC website. Guys, did you notice that? Did you notice that Marissa's in the chat? Did you guys pick up Healthcare Business Monthly this month? Where's mine? I just had it. Again, I don't know where anything is right now on my my office. But if you didn't read Healthcare Business Monthly that just came out, you have to pick it up because Marissa is our hashtag I am APC feature for the current month of Healthcare Business Monthly. Very, very cool. Uh, I'm not not to be, you know, like, like a cool kid, but I, I liked Marissa first. She was mine first. <laughs> Hello, Christopher Green. Great to see you guys in here. Jessica is taking her CPC test tomorrow on a Sunday. Awesome. Awesome. Any advice? So um, my advice would be work through any practice exams that you have. Just go through those. Make sure that your notes are all in order. Go through your books. Make sure that you don't have any sticky notes or anything in there yet that's still stray that you don't have um, that you're not allowed for the exam. Make sure that you're, you, if you have tabs, that they're tabbed appropriately. No post-it notes, sticky notes, any loose papers that you have in there. Make sure that those are already out ahead of time so that you're prepared for the exam. Um, practice exams are a good thing to go over. Just reading through your guidelines. Try not to do too, too much the night before your exam, but just kind of make sure that everything you have is in order, that you have your books. If you're taking it online, make sure that you have your webcam set up. Make sure you know how to, you've read through your emails. That's another really important thing is that night before your exam, read through that email about, you know, where are you taking it? If you're online, make sure you have any software installed. I know they use 
typically two different platforms. I think Zoom and something else, maybe WebEx. Um, if you're taking it in person, make sure that you know how to get there. Make sure you have a plan for if you encounter traffic that you know how to contact your first proctor in the event that anything could happen on your, your journey over there. Um, and that you have all of your things that you need, if whether that be your pencils if you're in person, you have your webcam ready, you have highlighters if you need them, um, and that just everything's kind of in order. You have all your books and stuff ready. Everyone's wishing you lots and lots of luck in the chat, it looks like, too. Um, Patricia, I will be responding to your question and about that specific course, so I don't go over specific information for my classes and courses on my live stream. What do I need on my computer to take the CPC online? So they'll send you instructions. They'll send you instructions, but the, the general is there's going to be probably a software install, either Zoom or one of the WebExes or something like that, I think they use. But as far as what you need on your computer, you also have to have an external webcam. So if you have a webcam that's built into your laptop, you're going to need an external webcam. So something that's not attached to your computer because they basically are going to want you to kind of sweep. Like this is my one of my external webcams. They're going to want you to kind of sweep around and show what's on your desk so that they can see that you don't have any extra cameras set up, that you're recording the questions as they're coming along. So external webcam, um, and then you're allowed nothing else on your desk except for your code books. And I think your whiteboard and marker board but they'll send you instructions online. So just make sure that you you go through that email that the AAPC sends you of all of the, the information, read through that. How much does a webcam cost? Not too much a webcam these days. Um, they're, they're pretty cheap, maybe $20. You can buy one online. And it's it, webcams have developed to the point now that you don't even need to worry too much about getting one that's not good quality because even the off-brand ones, if they say that they're in 1080p or 720, you know, they're, they're usually pretty good. And I have, this is, I don't think I can show you this. I can kind of show you how, well, maybe I can if I move my document camera around. Let's, let's, let me see if I can do this. Oop. Can I show you where my, where my stock is? So there's my big camera. Oh yeah. So if you look way over over there on the pole, <laughs> that's where my side camera is. So I have basically a, um, almost like a, a portable selfie stick. And that's kind of on the, on the webcam there so that it points up like, like this. And this is, it's a pole. So it's extendable. It goes up and down and I can move it around, but it's like a little selfie stick. And I think that only cost I don't know, like 20, $25 on Amazon. Christina, I know I saw you coming in this wood right away. So let me get to it. When it comes to CPT coding, can you use a parent code more than once if you are using a different child code under what is being coded? So when we're talking about like an add-on code, the parent code, can you use that more than once if you're using a different child code under what is being coded? Um, it depends on on exactly what you're coding, I would have to see a specific example. But if you're talking about like, can you use, you have to use the add on code with one of the parent codes that it goes with, but you can use that parent code multiple times if it was done multiple times, but I would I would have to look at a specific code, unless you're looking for me to do homework answer questions for you. Mallory is saying I need some positive vibes. I removed my A by completing practical. Congratulations to you, Mallory, and fist bump, boom. Uh, I completed a medical coding career diploma and still having a hard time finding a job. So there's lots of job strategies that you can have. So my first one is usually check uh, indeed.com, check codersdirect.com. So codersdirect.com is one of the top resources for medical coding jobs. You can search there for jobs. You can... Trying to think, who did I just recently see that's hiring possibly apprentices? Check Imagine Solutions. I feel like I've seen some job postings from them recently. So check Imagine Solutions, H-I-M. 
I-G-I-N-E, Imagine Solutions. I think they, I think I've seen some postings for them. But it's one of those things where you just can't give up. You have to check on Coders Direct, check indeed.com. One of the tips I like to give as far as indeed.com is type for things like CPT and ICD 10 CM into the search versus medical coder because then it's going to pull up all of the jobs that are looking for skills that people that know that CPT and people that know ICD 10 CM. So you're not just isolated to jobs that just have a coder title to them. They'll pull in other things where they want those skills of being able to use those code sets. Um, the other thing you can do is if you haven't already, Project Resume has a really great resume service specifically for medical coders. So if you go to Project Resume, they can help format your resume in a way that those recruiters that are looking to hire coders are going to be able to pull yours out of their pool when they're doing their searches. Like if there's a certain skill that, they, that recruiters are searching for, Project Resume knows how to format your resume in such a way that your resume will pull up during those searches. So they are an amazing, amazing resource as well. Isabel, good morning, good morning to you too. Bray is asking any advice for auditing. I just got promoted from coding denials. Well, congratulations on your promotion. That's really, really exciting. Um, as far as auditing, the gold standard I'm going to tell you is anything from NamUs, the National Association for Medical Auditing Specialists. They're great. Um, but as far as if you're looking into resources, make sure that you get familiar with your local Medicare contractor and their regulations. Go on their website and see if they have training specifically for things like if you're doing evaluation and management, a lot of them have really good training for that. Um, there is a pretty good auditing resource that I have. Let's see here. Ripping over my cord. So I got this from Optum360 and it's pretty good, the auditor's desk reference. So it has some auditing tips specifically for different things in there like surgeries and just tips for um, different definitions, different um, just little, little tidbits and things. I, th I think an encoder would probably be good too. If you don't have access to an encoder, make sure you get access to an encoder. I think there's even, there's even some cool grids in this book. So this is the auditor's desk reference from Optum 360. But I, um, <laughs> yeah, Pam, Pam, you're not, you're not biased at all. The name is. Um, but yeah, the, the encoder products are really going to be helpful too to check for those CCI edits, to look at those lay descriptions. I just did one of my videos where I did a case study. And if you guys want me to do more case studies, definitely let me know in the comments. But, you know, if I'm looking at a code and I'm like, oh, I think this is the right one. I'm not 100% sure. It's just really helpful to go into my Codify encoder, type in that CPT code and see the lay description and kind of go through what it is and then look at my op report and go, oh yeah, this is, this is definitely what my surgeon did. Because it gives you that more robust information versus just that tiny little narrative that they give you in CPT, like actually talking you through what the surgeon does and then comparing that to your note. So those are some of my tips, I think, for auditing. If you're in it for the long haul, you probably want to look into getting that CPMA credential too. Let's see, let's see. Oh, so just something in general. I was reading my CPT intro things. It said when you use a child code, you drop what is after the semicolon on the parent code. Yeah, so I was actually thinking, and I need to do that. I'll have to add it to my list. Just a little video on how to kind of read the CPT book. Because I know we have a lot of people in here that are kind of new. And sometimes they don't always explain this in a way that it clicks when you're going through some of the, the programs in, in medical coding. So let's actually take a look at my CPT book here. So when we're talking about how to read your CPT codes, ooh, getting a little floppy. Let me zoom in actually a little bit. Ooh, 
Whoop, whoop, whoop. Okay, there we go. So thoracoscopy surgical with pleurodesis. That's our full description here. But you see how here we have this semicolon and then we have all of these codes after it. So this is how we would read it. Thoracoscopy surgical semicolon and then code 32651 is with partial pulmonary decortation. So that would be our full. So this would be our parent and then the child. So thoracoscopy surgical with partial pulmonary decortation. So the description for this one, because we're just kind of basically trying to save on text here as we're printing the manuals, thoracoscopy, surgical, semicolon, that's where we stop, go down to this code, with total pulmonary decortation, including intrapleural pneumolysis. <laughs> hey, Jamie Ken, thank for your super chat. Appreciate, appreciate, appreciate that very, 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 very much. Why is my computer not making my sounds for me? No, no, no. Thanks for the super sticker, Jamie Ken. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, what else are we doing today? Carrie says, just found your channel and I'm glad I did. I'm a student. I just started with diagnosis coding. Your older videos have helped me since the classes are online. Well, I'm glad that they've been helpful to you. And one of the things that I've done, because I know there are a lot of students that are just coming in now, you know, that late August, September is when we're, we're got a lot new coding uh, students in community colleges, in our business schools. I have a lot of my stuff organized in playlists because it just makes it a lot easier for depending on what you're looking at. So if you go to the main channel page here, there are a bunch of different playlists you can check out. So this is the one I direct people to when they're like, hey, Victoria, I want to uh, get into medical coding. I'm not quite sure where to start. I made this whole playlist of all of my beginner videos. So want to be a medical coder, start here, how to become a medical coder, billing versus coding, the introduction to medical coding, salary, the costs associated, if it's right for you. And CPC exam tips, that's always a popular one. So if you're looking for CPC exam tips, boop, 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 you can binge that whole playlist. Um, and then e &M, and then ICD-10-CM coding guidelines, all in a playlist. So if you're not sure where to start with your ICD-10-CM, you can go right here and it'll just play through the whole thing for you, as well as medical coding, CPC review. So I'm going through different chapters in here. So the video on tabbing the books is how how I find you. Yeah, so I might I might have to even do some supplements to that. The funny thing about the tabbing video is I'm finding out that different people want a different type of tabbing video, which is why it's so great that there's more content creators, I think, developing different things. Because my tabbing video I'm finding out is not suited to certain people because some people want to actually see me right out on the tabs. Like I... When I made my video, I'm like, oh, well, no one's going to want me to, to sit there and watch me actually write out every little little word on the tab. But some people actually want that. They're like, hey, you, why did you fast forward through that? I wanted to see you sit and write all the words on the tab. So I think there are some more videos that now that are, are more detailed towards that to actually showing you how to write out some of the tabs for the ones that aren't like the pre-printed. So like our CPT book, they have them pre-printed for us. Ooh. So in the front flap, right here, we have our tabs in CPT. But a lot of the ICD-10-CM books don't come with these, so you have to write out the tabs. And some people like to see the process of the, the writing out of the tabs, apparently. AAPC practice papers to CPC exam. I'm not quite understanding what you're asking. Um, if you could clarify a little bit more, are you looking for... Do I offer papers to practice the CPC exam? Because there are lots of practice guides available. Uh, you can find some on Amazon. I'm not always confident because I, I did take one certification prep book from Amazon before and it just mm, wasn't, wasn't quite hitting the mark. Um, but I have some practice materials on my website. So of course there's everything on the YouTube channel is, is free for you guys. You can access anything there as far as CPC stuff and prep and all of that goodies. But I also have some paid uh, items on my website. So if you go here onto contempocoding.com under the courses, 
I have prep for the CPMA. I have prep for the CRC full courses. I don't have a full CPC course yet. I'm working with one of my partners on a program that I can refer you guys to. I have E&M training and I do have this, which is really helpful, the CPC practice um, exam and review. So that is available on my website. It is very affordable, $29.99. It comes with eight CEUs if you already have an AAPC certification. Bray, thank you for the super chat. $9.99 super chat from Bray. I appreciate the super sticker. Thank you guys so much. I really, really do appreciate all of the love and support that I've been getting on the channel. And if you want to support in other ways and you need education as well, you can purchase some of my courses like the CPC review. So I have that at eight CEUs if you already are AAPC certified and it comes with eight hours of video content reviewing chapter by chapter, some things that you'll commonly see on the CPC exam, some test strategies, um, pointing out some things that are more likely questions, like things that I know, concepts that I like, I know they like to kind of test on more commonly for the exam. And then it comes with a practice exam as well. I also have merch available. So if you're ever interested in purchasing a t-shirt or a coffee mug to support the channel, I have that as well. This is the one I have on today. It is like super comfy too. Super, super comfy. What is time sensitive for your online practice exams? I'm not quite sure what you're referring to as time sensitive. Do you mean like if they have time, like does it time, does a timer go on them? Because you don't, I don't time the access. So if you're asking about how long do you have access for them, you're going to have access for them for as long as you need. I don't terminate students from my courses. I don't require paid extensions. As long as I'm in business, you're in business, you will have access to whatever courses that I have available. Any key advice for new coding students? Yes. So I actually made a video on this not too long ago. That's on the channel too. One of the first things I, I stress upon is getting familiar with the layout of your books. You know, it seems funny because they're like, they're reference books to say, read them. And I'm not saying read them like you would if they were some sort of Nora Roberts novel, but you definitely want to just kind of page through them that you can kind of get familiar. There are certain things that you will want to read through like an actual book, like your, your ICD-10-CM guidelines you're going to want to read, your instructions on how to use the book you're going to want to read. But then when you start getting into the, the actual coding sections, just start kind of getting familiar with them. Flip page through page, kind of scan what's on the book, um, know where you're, get familiar with your appendix get familiar with uh, the different information that they have available on the books. And yeah, that's, that's my big first tab is really to start getting familiar with your books themselves. Yeah, the stainless steel coffee tumblers are back in stock. So that's awesome. Yeah, they are back. I think so anyway, because I know they were they were having a shortage of the tumblers. They're so cute. I, I, I think it's funny how popular tumblers are these days. I don't know about you guys, but whenever I'm scrolling through just about anything online, TikTok or Instagram, there always seems to be some sort of creator making custom tumblers that are glitter and they have nursing things or they have engineer things or career things or I love coffee or this is probably not wine. And, and people seem to be doing really good making the custom tumblers these days. When is the best time to purchase new code books? I use an encoder for work, but would like to have the books as well. Mm, oftentimes you can get pretty good deals for pre-ordering. I actually think someone from Optum called me the other day to ask if I was going to be pre-ordering my books. So I would check with some of the organizations like Optum. And I think AAPC offers pre-order sales. So the earlier you get them, the cheaper you can purchase them for. Um... But as far as best time to purchase, cost-wise would be early. Other than that, you know, um, trying to think if there would be any advantage to getting them later. 
I know there have been a couple of instances where the books have shipped late. And if there's back orders, then that means that it takes a longer time for you to get those books once you do place your order. So I would just try to get them as early as you can. You don't want to, you don't want to get into those back order situations. But honestly, if you have an encoder, sometimes things like the Hickpix book in the past, I, in, if, if I was in a position where I didn't use Hickpix terribly often, I wouldn't purchase a Hickpix book every year. If I had an encoder, I'd maybe purchase it every other year or every three years or so um, because I wasn't using it as frequently. What's the name of the girl on Instagram who has the colored pencil studies notes? You know what? I haven't seen any of her stuff pop up on my feed in a while, but I'll have to keep an eye out for it because she's great. I don't know if you guys have seen this. There's this girl who, I don't know if she's certified now or, or is still studying or what, but she would have these gorgeous, gorgeous notes that she would take. And they'd be like the cardiovascular system. And she'd draw these beautiful colored pencils, illustrations of the blood flow through the heart and then put the coding terms on it. It was like gorgeous. I, I haven't seen her though in a while. Katie says, I have a background in DME insurance qualification. I'm thinking about making a switch to medical coding. Just out of curiosity, what kind of computer software and programs do you use? Um, a lot of those programs and software I use uh, for coding purposes are more web-based. So things like my encoder programs are web-based. Um, for auditing, you might do different things. Like I think my IntelliCode, which I, I haven't purchased. I've been, I downloaded one for trial purposes on my PC because it's expensive. Some of the auditing software. Um, but that I use, most of the stuff I use is web-based and then anything that would be healthcare specific, like electronic medical record systems, those you're probably going to access remotely through something um, where you have to log in. So they might have like a, a VPN that you have to log into or a virtual network. Um, so those would be things like your Epic, your Meditech, your uh, Centricity. So most of them are PC based and then some web applications that I use as well. Evelyn is saying, with code books being updated every year, how long should I keep previous code year books? It depends on what the scope of your job is. If you're doing audits where you're going back a year or two, then you should probably keep a year or two of books just in case. Uh, if you are not, I, then maybe you only need to keep the prior year's books if you're just afraid that maybe you'll, you'll find something that someone asks you to code from last year, uh, maybe a provider forgot to hand something in and they want to make sure it gets coded so he gets the RVUs even if it's past um, past their their date of submission to to get paid for it. But yeah, so it kind of depends on your your scope of what you're doing. And with the encoder programs, oftentimes what you can do is set the date back. So if you're coding something or, or verifying codes for something from 2019, you can backdate your your uh, information in your encoder for that. And Pam brings up a great point. She says, we donate our old books to the local vocational schools. That's what some of the organizations around me have done. That's actually how I learned coding when I was in school. We had donated books. They were sitting in a shelf in the back corner. And I, at my community college, I didn't have my, my own purchase set of books. So whenever I was in coding class, I had to go to the bookshelf in the back and pull out an old year's book and use that to practice my coding. And that is very, very helpful. And sometimes um, there are even students that maybe can't afford new books and they can use those books from the previous year. So at least it's better than not having a book at all, even though there might be some code changes from the prior year. Nicole Torrance asks a great question. I've watched a lot of your videos and they are helpful in starting my coding program soon for the AAPC. I was wondering if you think pathophysiology is needed for beginners. I think you can probably skip it. It's better if you don't, but I think you can definitely get through medical coding and pass your certification exam without having it. It's one of those things where, you know, like pharmacology, you know, you, you can certainly pass your coding exams without taking ph pharmacology. I passed my coding certifications without taking pharmacology, but now I kind of regret it 
because I have to Google a lot of different medications. I don't know some of the generic names. Um, and it would definitely have been better if I'd have taken it back when I was studying and then I'd be that further step ahead. But as far as, as far as required, you can probably get away without taking, taking, uh, pathophysiology med term. I would say you absolutely should take as a medical coder. Yeah, Carrie, I would say keep your your 2020 books just for a little while and then maybe keep keep your your prior years and then start cycling them out every year. I've seen some people do some pretty cool stuff with their medical coding books that they can make wreaths with them. But most of us, I think we either donate them to a vocational school or we throw them in the recycling bin when we don't think we need them anymore. Tara Ritter is asking another great question. Any tips for coders with getting their first job as far as what to expect in your first job as well as preparing for the interview process? So I do have a couple of videos on that, but actually what to expect um, could vary a lot. But first, let me go through that first portion of it where we're talking about tips for landing your first job and interview. And maybe that should be another playlist that I have, just job tips and interview tips, because I have, I think, probably enough at this point for a playlist. But if you go back to the main channel page here, there is, I believe, a search up here that you can do. Let's click and zoom. So you can search, and I know I have a couple of videos on job tips. So there's how to find a medical coding job in 2021. That one has had a lot of views, a lot of great comments on it. This one, let's see if I can find it here. Bertram's interview was great, but I have mock interviews as well that are very helpful. And this one with Kyle, a lot of great feedback that this was very insightful. So I brought on Kyle Johnston, who has done a lot of recruiting of, oh, what the heck, who has done a lot of recruiting of wrong camera, who has done a lot of recruiting of medical coders in the past. And that was a great interview here with Kyle. So that has some great tips about different things that they're looking for when they're hiring coders about whether or not to hire um, new coders when it says, you know, they're looking for two years of experience. As far as what to expect in your first job, it, it kind of depends on what type of coding you're doing. And now it's changed a lot because we've gone from a lot of in-person training where, you know, you meet up and you're like, oh, here's your coding buddy and they're going to be your partner and they're going to show you the software and they're going to take you around and show you where the break room is to now everything kind of being online. So that format has changed a lot. So it really depends on, on if you're going in person, if you're going online, what that training is going to look like. Um, and of course, sometimes, you know, you might be hired into a large coding organization where they have a whole orientation plan for you. Other times it, you might be the billing coding person for a physician and the practice manager is just kind of going to go, okay, here's, here's everything and get to it. Um, so that, that really can, can depend. I can give you, I have some different, different tips for interview processes, for being prepared um, about, there's even a video I think I have now on, on the um, exams that they give you, the pre-employment exams, because they that's another thing to expect in your interviews is a pre-employment exam. A lot of employers now will say that they, you know, even though you're certified, you've gone through your, your certification exams, they want to see where you are when you're not picking a code out of four different options. And also they might have something that's targeted for the specific position that they're hiring for. So if it's a large cardiology practice, they're probably going to ask you a pre-employment questionnaire or exam that has cardiology geared questions on it. Um, or if maybe it's a large organization. So what I used to do when I hired coders, is we had a lot of primary care and then we had a lot of surgical specialty. So we put a different mix of things in the pre-employment exam so that we could see, oh, okay, well, this person did pretty good on e &M. We should maybe put them in more of our family practice or internal medicine type of situations. Or if they did really well in surgery, oh, okay, well, this might be a surgical coder. Um, or we might see, oh, you know what, they were a little rough on this. So maybe, you know, we're, they're going to need some more training, but we really think this is a good cultural fit. But then we had that preparation ahead of time like, oh, we're going to need to put some in some additional training into this person to get their coding a little bit more accurate to where we need it to be.
So <laughs> this question, uh, the CBCS exam, I, I try to be very tactful about what I say in regards to that. Um, when I talk about coding certifications, if you were to go on to indeed.com and type in CPC or CPB or CCS, there's going to be a lot of different jobs that will populate for those. Um, not always so much for other certifications. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with those certifications, that you should not get those certifications. I think any additional educational opportunities or credentials you want to seek, go for it. Absolutely go for it. But understand that when we talk about coding, A, P, C, and Ahima are like the Coke and Pepsi in the coding world. Those are the two brands that everyone's going to be looking for. So chances are good that if you're looking for a coding job, they're going to want to see a credential through AAPC or AHIMA. Helena is asking, I've been an administrative assistant in airline back home, but now want to continue my career and pick CPC, the Certified Professional Coder. Good choice. My community colleges give CPC as non-credit. What do you suggest? I've got a degree in English. So that's fine. I'm going to be honest with you. That's how I started out. I went to my community college. It was not a, a college credit, like an associate degree program. It was a degree, uh, I guess, degree program, not really associate's degree, diploma program, maybe they called it. And I have, it just says I have a certificate from Reading Community College as a medical billing specialist. It, I think they do have something now where they might transfer some of it to an associate's degree if I now wanted to get my associates in coding, because at the time they didn't offer an associate's degree. Going back, I would probably get my associate's degree because I think it would just, I don't know, I mean, I don't think it would have been an exceptional additional amount of schooling and probably would have given me some of those things like pharmacology that I didn't take around my first round. But yeah, you can still do everything you want with just having that community college certificate. That's all I have. Um, if you want to get into management, if you want to get into some more advanced roles in the revenue cycle a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree might not be a bad idea. But if you just want to do medical coding, uh, most employers are just looking for that certification that you have your CPC or you have your CCA through AHIMA. If you're still looking for a program, I do have some suggestions as far as that goes. So I have a association with where is it? With onlinedegree.com. So if you're looking to take a course completely online, they have a quiz that they've developed specifically for my viewers that basically asks you the same kind of questions that I would ask you. You know, where are you located? How soon do you want to be done? Do you want books included? And they can direct you. And it is, it is US based. <laughs> it is US based. And they will be able to pair you with the appropriate program that's good for you. Because, of course, I'm not familiar with every single program out there. So they will help you direct um, to a program that will work with you within your time frame, within your budget. And I'm actually working with them on some additional very exciting, very exciting offerings to hopefully be coming up soon. Daniel is asking, hi, I have one doubt for e &M preventative care. New patient came to preventative care, same time, new problem diagnosed. Can we code new preventative care and e &M care? Uh, the e &M is newer established. So you can only code one new visit to the best of my knowledge. So only one of them can be new. One of them has to be established. You can't code two new at the same time. The thing that you have to consider is when you think about a patient's coming in for a preventative visit, a well visit, and then they have a problem at the same time, there has to be enough separate from what was done on that preventative exam to warrant a whole e &M. Now, of course, if it's an office visit, the exam and history is kind of taken out of the picture now, right? So we're focusing on medical decision making. But if we think about, okay, here's everything that went into the preventative exam, here's everything that normally goes into the preventative exam, is there enough to still score out an E&M? 
Could be, could be if it was a problem. Um, they came in with some kind of con chest congestion or they had some kind of laceration. Yeah, uh, we could probably maybe get a level two or a three out of that. So it, it just really factors in if the documentation will warrant that that level separate from that preventative on the same day. And if it was something above and beyond something just really incidental. So for example, if we're talking about a, a baby, a baby comes in and they're for their well baby visit and they've got diaper rash. Well, it's, it's common for a baby to have diaper rash. That's a very incidental thing. It, you know, the provider's just like, yeah, put some cream or some powder or something on it. Um, not really warranting an additional e &M, right, for that tiny little incidental thing. So if the pre patient comes in, though, it's a baby, they're coming in for their well baby visit, and they have, you know, pink eye or something, yeah, then we can probably code, do the well visit, and then do that problem, okay, we we're going to have to prescribe something for that. And that might, might more than warrant those two visits. Kathy, I was an RHIT encoder in the 90s. Would my experience still be valid with a CPC credential? So if you're asking if that will be enough to sit for the CPC, the CPC examination doesn't have any official hard and fast requirements. So if you're someone who's just walking off the street and wants to sign up for a CPC exam, you can. Uh, I would suggest, though, some refresher courses. So there's a couple of ways you can go through this. You could try to just buy some self-study material since you kind of know some of the basics of it, right? Um, and just purchase like the step-by-step -step books that I recommend through Bucks. I think I have them linked in the video description. You could try just going through those and self-studying. Um, you could purchase another course if you want, go through the CPC training online. You could even just buy a practice exam, see how you do on the practice exam. Um, if you were trained in the 90s, you were trained in ICD-9, so you're probably going to need some ICD-10 training if you haven't done that already. You can find all kinds of different resources for ICD-10 training. Actually, I have an ICD-10 program on the website. Let's go back here. So I do have an ICD-10 essentials course. So if you need new training in ICD-10 because you were trained in I-9, you can purchase that. And I do have a CPC review as well. That is for if you're you're like kind of getting gearing up to take that CPC exam and you want to refresh through everything again. And it comes with a practice examination. You could also check cco.us has what they refer to as their blitz programs. And I recommend those for situations kind of like this where maybe you don't need a whole full medical billing coding program, but you need something more than just a, a quick prep. So those are kind of in between. So that might be another one to check out at cco.us. They have some of their blitz programs. Danny's asking, this is a great question. I love this one. Victoria, will attaining a bachelor's in HIM make a difference in the medical coding field, especially if you already have your CCS and CPC? It kind of depends. Um, so as far as a difference, one of the differences is if you have your HIM degree, that's the only way you can get your RHIA. You can, it's the only way you can be qualified to sit for that credential. If you're just planning on doing medical coding, you just want to be a coder or you just want to be an auditor, you don't really need a bachelor's degree. Where the bachelor's degree I see more so come in is in management positions. If you want to be a revenue cycle director, if you want to be a manager of the inpatient coding department. Um, although honestly, I've seen them make some exceptions here and there. If you have 10 years of experience and you're just really qualified. Um, I have seen it recommended in certain types of auditing roles, but not always required. When will ICD-10, uh, well, when will ICD-11 codes come into effect until when will the exams be based on ICD-10? So there is no implementation date in the United States yet for ICD-11. It is available for use starting January 1. So available for use doesn't mean that we're going to start using it on January 1. It just is kind of like it's offered, it's out there if you want to start using ICD-11, everything's good and, and good to go. Um, but there's not even talk yet about 
updating the software to ICD-11. Medicare is not really looking at updating their policies yet to ICD-11. Um, so it is not something I would worry about too much. And there's absolutely no information yet as far as when testing on that will become, when the implementation in the U.S. is going to start. It is available for use. It is out there, the code set is there, but there's no time frame yet of when we're going to start using it in the United States. When we think about our transition from ICD-9 to ICD-10, that was a long time, more than a decade. So I would not anticipate a transition from ICD-10 to ICD-11 for at least another five years. All of my friends, when I tell them five years, they say, absolutely not. It's going to be another 10, 15. So I would not worry about ICD-11 yet. Is there a lot of coders resigning because of vaccine requirements? I haven't seen too much yet, to be honest with you. Um, I have heard some complaints, uh, understandably. It's it's a sensitive situation. People are going to, people have very strong opinions these days. You know, I'm not much of one for being an extremist on one side or the other. But, you know, I certainly respect that everyone has their, their different opinions on things. Um, I haven't seen a lot of resignations. I did talk to one of my friends just a couple of weeks ago, and she did say that her particular hospital was requiring that they have it, at least their first dose by the end of the month, or they could fill an exception. I'm not quite sure what the exception criteria is, but that was something that they were offering. And uh, if they did not either do one of those two options, vaccinate or have the required exception form filled out by the end of the month that they would no longer be employed as of the end of the month. So I haven't heard of a lot of resignations. I'm sure that they'll, that they are out there. Uh, I don't doubt that. I have a CPCA and I just landed a job at an insurance company reviewing claims against payer rules. I'm not coding, but I hope my experience is relevant if I want to pursue a future coding job. Absolutely it is. And if you look at some of the requirements that the CPC has for removing your apprentice status, it doesn't say you have to code charts, you have to be a surgical coder, you have to be an E&M coder. It says that you have experience working with the code sets. So oftentimes working in the billing settings, working with those insurance companies and working with things like, oh, well, why was this CPT code denied? Oh, well, it was because of this diagnosis code. You're working with the code sets and they will count that then towards some of your experience requirements for your apprenticeship status removal. So yeah, I think that's absolutely a fantastic way to get involved in the code sets, which will then hopefully eventually transition into a role as a medical coder. You don't have to transition to a medical coder if you find out that you really just like the job that you're at doing the um, claim reviews. Sometimes people do that. They they go they go to become a certified coder. They get a billing job and they're like, nope, I just like it here. Um, but yeah, it will definitely be some great experience to help you transition then into a coding role should that be what your goal is. How likely is it to get a job remotely after graduating and taking your CCS? Um, I have heard it's it's difficult to find a remote coding job right off the bat, not impossible. Um, but as far as how to weigh that, as far as like on a scale from one to 10, I really can't say because the, the outcomes really, really vary by person, by location, by are you just looking for coding roles or are you also open to getting a job maybe in scheduling or in revenue cycle? So it, it's it's really hard to weigh because people just have such different outcomes based off of their personal experiences, based off of their certification. I would say if you're someone who went through a proper college or university or school and then got your CCS, probably a better chance than maybe someone who took like a two day, take your CPC program um, type of, of camp or something, you know, and didn't know med term and didn't know pharmacology because you have a lot more training, a lot more in-depth information. So probably better chance than someone who's trying to transition from like retail and then took a two day course in coding and sat for their CPC and passed it, uh, probably better chances than that kind of scenario.
Are there any audio-based materials that you're aware of for coding? I do know of one. Danita over at Integrity Coding, I think, has some audio only offering. So I would check out, go into Google and type out integrity coding or integrity coding Danita. I don't know her exact web address off the top of my head, but I know she does offer some audio only programs for coding. If you're looking on um, for audio based supplements too, there's a lot of medical coding podcasts that are coming out these days. Um, I know my friend Tony L. Holmes had to take a pause because she's expanding her family right now. And hopefully she'll be returning soon with the Alpha Coding Experts podcast because that is in my book, like number one. Um, Terry Fletcher. Terry Fletcher? Yes. Has the Codecast podcast, which has some great tidbits in it as well. Um, Brian Kui has a lot of great interviews with different people in the industry that are very eye-opening and enlightening. He's very good with community and community-based building. Um, so there's lots of audio materials as far as podcasts as well. And I apologize for all of my friends out there that I'm also probably forgetting about your podcast. Um, you know, it's, it's nothing against anyone I just, and I've talked about this a little bit, I haven't been absorbing a lot of content by other creators in my industry, only because it, it, I wind up hearing things or finding things that put me in a bad spot. Like one of the recent things that happened to me was I was on um, two different social media sites in one day and found two different people basically taking my content, posting it, and then going, hey, buy my products and services, sign up for my classes. So um, it, it, it mentally gets to me sometimes. So I have to kind of keep myself a little bit back from some of the other creators out there because it spirals. I start comparing myself. I start questioning why they're doing certain things certain ways. And yeah, so nothing against all of my other friends that have podcasts. I, I'm not trying to exclude anyone. <laughs> um, it's just that I've been absorbing other content instead where I'm riding It's a Small World in Disney. Carol is asking, if you work as an HCC coder, will that time apply towards the removal of your apprentice status? So there's only two certifications that have apprentice status for the AAPC, the COC and the CPC. Um, I would say that as far as will it fulfill your experience requirements for the CPC. Of course, the AAPC is the only one that can ultimately give that decision. But let's take a look kind of at what it says here for the apprentice status removal. Uh oh, my mouse is acting funny again. Remove your A. Apprenticeship status removal. So what it says is that you need at least two years on the job experience in lieu of the education experience or the practicode. And externships are accept, uh, accepted, but it says using the CPT, ICD-10-CM, or HCPCS level two code sets. So it says CPT, ICD-10-CM, or, not and, or. So to me, that tiny little nuance there of saying or CPT, ICD-10-CM, or HCPCS tells me that if you're just using ICD-10-CM, probably count that towards your apprenticeship status removal. But again, the AAPC would be the one that would have to give you the definitive on that. Um, question on cancer registry. I actually don't know too much about cancer registry, but I will look and see if I know anyone that does cancer registry, and then maybe I can bring them on the channel at some point to talk about what they do, and especially if they can kind of compare and contrast how that differs from medical coding. Lime, good to see you here. Hey, um, Difference between the CPC and the COC. So the COC is similar to the CPC. I've heard people say it's the CPC plus a little extra. I personally found the COC to be more difficult than the CPC, but some of the primary differences with the certification for the COC is they're going to ask you a lot more payment related questions about ambulatory surgical centers, um, about the outpatient prospective payment system. So if we look here on the information for the COC, it talks about 
a lot of the things that are, are similar on the exam for the, uh, compared to the CPC, med term anatomy, coding guidelines, right? But then there's that payment methodology. So that's one of the difference here is they're going to ask you things about the payment methodologies, and they're going to ask you about the difference between the outpatient perspective payment system and the inpatient perspective payment system. So charge masters, condition codes, um, they're going to ask some questions about the 1500 form versus the UB04, how to cover Medicare as a secondary payer. And I think there's a little bit of a difference too in the compliance. So uh, NCD, LCD, HIPAA, ABNs. And then also they're going to ask you some more surgery questions because of things like ambulatory surgical center coding. And the questions that they give you in regards to coding are going to be a little bit more targeted. So they're going to be asking you questions about things like emergency departments more likely than just necessarily, um, well, they're not going to ask you about inpatient, right? Because those would not be outpatient coding. So observation, critical care, and then there's specific types of surgery, radiology, lab and path, and medicine. That's what they're going to really focus on there. Not so much the like the more common inpatient surgeries, they're not going to ask you about, um, you know, anything that would not be listed here. So there's also going to be some small surgery things, like any kind of day surgeries. There might be a couple of those. There's going to be some things like office visits with laceration repairs. When I took the exam, there was a few things that were like, um, lesion and laceration repairs where you're doing multiple and you have to figure out one's this size and one's that size and what you can combine and what can't you combine and if debridement's included. So there's a couple of those. Lynn, you're asking one of my favorite questions. Do you think coding could be at risk due to automation later down the road? Um, I think every job right now is at risk due to automation down the road. I was watching a video recently um, where it was a hotel and they were having difficulty finding staff to run the meals up to the, to the rooms when people were ordering room service. So they got a robot. They took the plates and put them inside the robot. The robot was programmed to go up to the certain rooms and then knock on the door and deliver the food and people just pulled it out of the robot. Um, so, I mean, basically any job right now can be replaced by automation. Uh, is there going to be a shifting of medical coding due to automation? Absolutely. Uh, automation, though, has been a part of medical coding for as long as I've been a medical coder. We've had encoder products. We've had computer-assisted coding that we go through it's like a 3M encoder and we type in gallbladder and it goes, okay, well, what are you doing with the gallbladder? Are you biopsying it? Are you removing it? Are you incising it? And it will help kind of guide you to a code. So I think there is going to be a progression of roles in coding changing. I think there's going to be less positions, things like charge entry, where coders are just typing in codes that the provider said that they they performed. Um, I think there's going to be some of the lookup things like uh, diagnosis codes. A lot of the organizations I've worked in now, providers kind of pick what they think is their right code. They pick their their diagnosis codes. Sometimes they're very good at it, sometimes not so good. So I think there's going to be a transition that coders will do more thoughtful tasks, more auditing, more verification. Um, one concern I see from people is, oh, what if we go on like a Medicare for all type of program where uh, the government will pay for, for whatever because everyone will have like a baseline type of insurance. I don't think that will eliminate other insurances because if you even think about programs like Medicare, even though people over 65 get Medicare for quote unquote free, a lot of them elect to get a replacement program. So they pay extra to get a high mark or a cap or an Aetna or whatever, Geisinger, to pay for additional services. Because even though they have that baseline Medicare, it doesn't cover everything, or maybe there's certain providers that they want to go to or certain services that they can provide additionally. So they pay extra for that. Um, that, and the other, the other port, part of that is that just because the government is paying for everything doesn't mean that they have an endless budget and they're just going to go, oh, well, whatever you're billing, we'll just pay for it because there could still be providers that will be less than 
ethical and say, oh yeah, I did all of these very expensive surgeries just so that they can get paid extra. So there still will be roles for coders and auditors to work in those roles to identify those kinds of abuse of the government funds for healthcare, um, as well as even things like I have friends that work in the legal field that they work with lawyers and say, hey, this person was is on the hook for, you know, $250,000 worth of medical bills. They're about to go bankrupt. They're suing the hospital. We think we need someone to look at all of their medical bills and make sure that everything was coded appropriately. So I think that coding will transition to a more involved type of role where we're doing more auditing, doing more thoughtful work, having to understand maybe some more clinical processes. But uh, I don't think it will ever in any way, shape or form be eliminated, at least not for the foreseeable future. Change, yes, but eliminate, not so much. Um, one last question I'm taking here from Lime. Can you do a Codify review and walkthrough? I actually do have one on the channel website. Let me take a look and see if I can bring it up real quick. Almost positive I do. Hold on. Oh, it doesn't want to bring it up. Hold on. I know I have one here, but it's not coming up on search. Codify, 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 codify. What if I type an encoder? I'm not crazy, right? I have one where I walk through codify, right? Maybe I don't. You know what? I was thinking of Practicode. I was thinking of Practicode. I don't have one that goes walks through Codify. I think they do have some free preview resources though on the AAPC website, but I can I can take a look and see if I can do some stuff on Codify too. We are actually five minutes over my usual time for the stream. I had a really good time this week. This is really awesome. Um, I will see you guys next week. I have a couple of videos that I got to shoot and we'll get them ready for next week. So much great information. So much cool stuff to do. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. For those of you just starting, definitely check out the videos in the channel. I have all of those playlists just for my newbies that are starting out that want to learn ICD-10-CM that are looking for reviews. I'm um, going to be doing some more involved things as well. Some case studies I think seem to be doing very well. I will see you all next week. And until then, just keep on coding on.